Good evening. It is seven o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome tonight. Good to see you. And it is a beautiful November day. We are in Revelation chapter three, lesson eight. And we are in the last epistle to the churches. So we are, this is church number seven. And so we're going to talk about that. Before we get to the scripture, though, let me give a little bit of just some key points that I want to rehearse and make sure that we understand. Obviously, throughout this, we are looking for a greater revelation of Jesus Christ. That's, that's really been the focus and the center. And so tonight we'll see some more of that. Just want to remind you, because we're going to read it. Blessed are those who read, who hear, and who keep those things that are, that are written. So... If you're a keeper of what we read, you'll be triple blessed. Tell me, want to be triple blessed? Yeah? <laughs> read here and uh, do. So, this is like I said, this is the last of the seven churches. Just want to say that this book, Revelation, and in particular the churches that we study, has both present, historic, and prophetic value uh, to them. So, we'll see all of those kinds of things. What are we learning? How do we apply it? How do we apply it now? And what does it mean for the future? Uh, Book of Revelation, chapter 3, beginning with verse 14 through 22. Finish off that chapter. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold, Refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see as many as I love I rebuke and chasten therefore be zealous and repent behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come to him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is probably one that gets preached more often than any, uh, because it's talking about, it's very applicable, talking about, being hot or cold. Now we're going to talk about that. And it's not just what you think. There's some some things that were prevalent in Laodicea the area uh, that make that even more uh, applicable. So we're going to talk about hot and cold and all those kinds of things. Here it says they were lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. How many like a good cold glass of water? I mean, you know, there's just, when you're really thirsty, not like Diet Coke, but when I'm really thirsty, I want a good cold icy glass of water. How many of you, when your joints and your muscles are sore and you're achy, nobody like, nobody like that in here, right? We're all young and spry, we don't ever be. How many like to get in a hot tub or just a, a soak in a good hot tub of water and just get those muscles and those joints loosened up. You see, there's value to both hot and cold. There's value to both of those. There's very little value to lukewarm. It really isn't. Now, my wife can go to the faucet and stick the cup underneath there and just drink water that's not cold. I don't like it. 
I want it, I want it cold. I want it to be cold or hot. I want my coffee to have steam rolling off of it, or I want my water to have ice in it. Because they both have value. So when we look at this, don't look at hot is good and cold is bad. Because it's the in-between state that doesn't have the value that it ought to have. And we're, and I'm, we're gonna kind of prove that by some historical knowledge of the area of Laodicea, that this is the context of that. And it's important for us to understand that. So what is the age group that we're talking about? So this church represents the age of about 1900 through the tribulation. So uh, if I was preaching, I'd say, tell your neighbor, that's now. 1900 through the tribulation is the age that we're looking at. It's the age that we live in now. Just because we live in this age, it does not mean that we individually, nor as a church, have the characteristics of the Laodicean church. Hopefully we don't. I pray that we are not a lukewarm church. Amen? That we're on fire for the Lord. That we're a cold drink of water who's for, to somebody who needs relief from tribulation and trials and all of that. Just because we live in this age, though that is a representation in general of the age that we live in. And, and I think if you were to look across a broad spectrum of churches that we would see in this age that there is a lot of lukewarmness about many churches. I don't say that to brag about our church, because if we don't watch it, we could slip over into being lukewarm as well, right? How do you keep from being lukewarm? Stay close to the fire. Stay close to the fire. I love that. Stay close to the fire. How do we apply that to a church service? What do we do? We let the Holy Spirit flow and move and we enter in. We don't sit back and just watch and somebody else will do it, you know, all that. But we enter in and there's a reason why on the day of Pentecost it said tongues of like tongues of fire that said upon them. The Holy Spirit, that fire talks about power. But also, what does fire do? Refines, purges, makes pure. We see all these applications of hot and cold uh, throughout this. One of the characteristics of this church, and I think if you'll look at the day and age that we live in, is that this church was very wealthy. The age that we live in is a very wealthy age. When you look at it historically, and I had the privilege of taking a history of Christianity class, not finishing that not too long ago, this is the richest age throughout all history. Even though not everybody's rich, but it is the richest <laughs> church age in particular. And you'll see that, you see that in particular, I would say, I, I haven't checked lately, but I know at one point in history, the Catholic Church was literally the richest organization in the entire world. Bigger, holding more land mass, more properties, more uh, richer than even some factories and big businesses, okay? So uh, this is a rich, wealthy area as well, the Laodicea it was, and this time frame that we live in is a very wealthy time frame. Uh, Lord, give us some more wealth, amen? <laughs> uh, to do your work, right? Uh, so one of the characteristics is the wealth. The church in Laodicea was also in a very wealthy area, and it, in general, did not suffer persecution like many of the other ages. Though there have been world wars and things like that, we have not as the church, capital C, experienced the type of persecution that they did uh, at the very beginning when people were being stoned and pulled apart and burned and put, put in oil and you know, all those kinds of things that we know that the disciples uh, and the apostles many of them went through. So this is a not as persecuted age, very little outside persecution, very prosperous age. But in saying that, of all the churches that we've discussed, I would say that this church, if you were to give it a grade, how does the Lord 
speak about this church, he probably gives it the worst grade of all. Because there's very little good about this church that's lukewarm. When we look at this, we'll, we'll see that. As a matter of fact, the church of Laodicea gets no commendation whatsoever. It doesn't say you've done anything here. So that's a sad state. I want to say again, Lord, don't let us be the church of Laodicea, right? We want to be on fire for the Lord. In contrast to Philadelphia, the church of Philadelphia, which Jason talked about last week, that church didn't have any condemnation. They were the church, everybody knows, you talked about last week, I listened, I heard your, your voices. Philadelphia means what? Brotherly love. So that's why a church that's full of the love of God is going to get some attaboys, some commendation from uh, the Lord. And so we want to strive to be like that. So really, Philadelphia represents the true church. It was not a perfect church, yet it was perfect in position. What do I mean by that? What was its position? On the right path, for one thing. On the right path. Its position was in Christ. We can be in Christ and not be perfect, but yet be in perfect position. So we're saved, right? We're under the grace and the blood of Christ. That doesn't mean we're perfect, but we're in a perfect position because we're in Christ. That is important for us to understand uh, because this is the verse that Kay actually asked me about when we first started talking about these churches. Why do you say commendation or condemnation? Because the church that is in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ. So the church of Philadelphia was in Christ and they were in a perfect position, but yet not perfect. I mean, as long as we're in these human bodies, we'll never be perfect, right? But we can be perfectly under the blood of Christ and be saved. So that's important for us to understand. So we can be perfect in position, but not necessarily perfect in condition. That's a play on words, purposeful. What does the Bible tell us? It says, work out your own salvation with what? Fear and trembling. If I'm saved, why do I need to fear and tremble? I'm in a perfect position, but I'm not necessarily in a perfect condition. So therefore, I am working out my own salvation with fear and trembling, and I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to convict and to change me, and I'm listening to the Holy Spirit. You see, there is a, a, a difference, and I, I know it may sound a little bit like semantics, but we can be in perfect position, but not perfect condition. But guess what? We don't have to be in perfect condition to make it to heaven, amen? And you still have the Holy Spirit say, that wasn't right. you shouldn't have done it that way. That wasn't right. You should have talked nicer to that person. You should, you should have been sweet. You should have been, you know, all this kind of stuff. If the Holy Spirit's still doing that, then every time you get in your car, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, sometimes we, we need to really be saved when we get in a car, don't we? And uh, <laughs> so there is a difference in being perfect in position, but not perfect condition. Hopefully I didn't confuse anybody. You know what I'm talking about. So this Philadelphia church was positioned in Christ. And so it was in good shape. The church of Laodicea, when you study it, many would call it the institutional church. The church of the age. All the government and all of the structure was there. Everything that made it look like a church on the outside, but not on the inside. It was lukewarm. Neither hot nor cold. And we said both of those things are good, right? You want to be hot or cold. Actually, that's what it says. I wish you would be either hot or cold. And I can I can I just be honest with you? When I first started preaching, I preached hot was good and cold was bad. But that's not what this is talking about. They both have value. Let's look at a little, little deeper. The what is the 
here we're trying to get a greater revelation of Jesus. What are the things that it says about the character of Jesus? He is the what? The amen. What does amen mean? So be it. For sure. Jesus is the amen. He is the final word. Right? Uh, he is the amen. He is. So he's the final word. So whatever he said goes. Huh? It should. It should. Yes. So he is. He is the amen. So here's a church. That's lukewarm. Neither hot nor cold. And what do we say about the characteristics that we learn about Jesus? It's the answer for the church. So here's a church that needs to be steadfast and true because it's neither one. It's neither hot nor cold. And Jesus is the amen. He is the right on. He's the in line. So they need to get, they need to either get hot or cold. So he's the amen, the final word, the author and the finisher is another way that it's said throughout the scripture, the perfecter of our faith. So all of these characteristics fit into the needs of the church that we see. It says that he is the faithful and true witness. He's the real deal. This tells my age, but I say it all the time. You know that commercial from years ago, and y'all are older than me, so I know you saw it. Uh, not everybody, Kay's not older than me. But anyway, uh, Coke is the is the real thing, right? No, Jesus is the real thing. He's the faithful and true witness. In contrast to the Laodicean church, who was neither hot nor cold, he is the real deal. If Jesus is the faithful witness, what does he witness of? I was supposed to have jury duty Monday and next Monday. I praise the Lord. I went down there and they said, you didn't get the notice. You don't have to serve. I was like, that's awesome. I'm glad I didn't have to. But if Jesus is the witness, the faithful and true witness, what does he witness to? To everything, really, if you stop thinking about it. I mean, to everything. So creation because he created it all, right? The Bible tells us he bears witness of the Father. He bears witness of the gospel. And he bears witness of himself. And, and really, I hadn't thought about that, Linda, but he also bears witness of creation because he was the creator, right? He spoke the word. And everything that we know came to be. Jesus told him, I wish you were either cold or hot. Not in the middle. I mean, that's what happens when you sit on the fence. You get splinters, right? In the middle is never where we're supposed to be. We need to be on fire for the Lord. We need to be uh, blessing people. When I talk about the cold, it's like the blessing. Of, we ought to refresh the, the places that we come into. We ought to be a breath of fresh air whenever we come into a place of work or into a place. Because everybody else there that isn't a Christian... Man, they don't have much to look forward to. And life, you know, and, and we, we should come in as a just a breath of fresh air. Well, praise God. I'm glad to be alive today. And, you know, just annoy everybody to death, right? Uh, <laughs> because we're so happy to be alive. So we ought to be cold or hot. So you don't want to ride the fence. So how do we know that I'm right in saying hot and cold are both good? When you go to the history of Laodicea, it had a viaduct that transported water from the hot springs, which were about seven miles away from Laodicea. So imagine you're capturing this hot springs water, but yet you have to transport it for seven miles to get to the city of Laodicea. What's going to happen to the water? It's going to cool down. It's not going to be cold and refreshing. It's not going through the ice caps or anything like that, but it's going to be lukewarm when it gets there. Cold would have been good. Hot would have been good. But the lukewarm, the intermediate stage, and Jesus said it was disgusting. So much so that he said, I will vomit you out. He didn't say, I'm going to spit a little bit. 
He didn't say, I'm going to gag. He said, I'm going to vomit you out, right, if you're lukewarm. I know that's graphic, but I'm, I'm trying to get across a picture here that to the Lord, we're to be hot or cold. Not in reason. I have a question. Yes. I, I've always thought if you're cold, you don't have enough care about you at all. That is not good either. For me, but, but that's not what this is. That's not the context of this. The historical context of this is that cold would have been good and hot would have been good. Lukewarm is not good. It's in the middle. Now, do you need the fire of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. But the context of this is telling us, because Jesus said, I wish you were even cold. hot or cold. But that cold not, I, I always <laughs> thought of it as not being good because I'm taking it as either cold or shock. But God's not going to want us to be cold. But he's not going to want us to be cold, is he? The law versus the spirit, which you know you say too much, you know, dry up, or too, yeah. dry too much word you dry up. That you know, I would rather you be under the law, or I would rather you be under grace. You can look at it that That's way. That's kind of the way I but, like, but I wondered that. But the way. historical context of this, which we have to know, tells us that this is what it's talking about. Because otherwise, he wouldn't have said, he would have said, I wish you were hot and not cold. He didn't say that. He said, I wish you were either hot and or cold. There's a Absolutely. Of those. Yes. So we are to be, we'll skip ahead, but it says the answer for us is to be zealous and to repent. What's zealous? On fire. Passionate. I'm telling you that I used to preach it and teach it that way, but when you look at the historical context of it, you begin to see more. I think that's wrong a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and now I would be the first to tell you that I think the Lord would want us to be on fire for Him, passionate, I want and I understand. Lord. Yeah, yeah, you want hot? Yeah, I understand that. This church of Laodicea doesn't really, if you look at the context of hot and cold, and they're in the middle, in the middle kind of alludes to the fact that they don't really believe anything. You know, they're kind of swam this way and swam that way, and, and they're not sold out. They are a professing church, but not a possessing church. Yeah. 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 So if if we don't now, I say this about this church, and we're we're talking about all the condemnation. But if we don't watch, we could be there. So because these things were written for our edification, for us to grow and to have to gain knowledge of. And I think it gets to really what Kay was talking about. We need to be passionate about God. I know we're Pentecostal, but you don't have to shout and run the aisles and scream to be passionate about God here. You can meet people's needs and be good Samaritan and be, you know, be passionate about God. It's not about, sometimes we, <laughs> as Pentecostals, we, we get wildfire instead of just fire. And wildfire is not good. Fire of the Lord has a purpose and a Focus, yes. So um, we have to. I'm not saying hold back and don't let the spirit move. And I know that sometimes I'm not saying that at all. I'm a very passionate person, and you know I get loud when I preach, and I like to worship, and I'll shout hallelujah, and I'll you know all those things. But there is a decently and an order about it as well. Let's not be wildfire. Let's just be fire and power, right? Uh, and connected with the Lord. Is everybody tracking with me uh, today? Hopefully so. So this was a professing church, but not a possessing church. But how did the church describe itself? It says, you say I am what? Rich. Wealthy. Wealthy. Need for nothing. Don't need anything. I'm set, Lord. 
I've got it all. I don't even need your help at all. That's pretty much what this church was saying. We got it all under control. We got all the programs. We got all the, uh, you know, we got all, we got money. We got people. We got buildings. We got, what, what, what was I preaching about? Something? You can have all that and not have the Holy Spirit moving, and you're at a loss. Uh, you're not really going to accomplish what God's called you to do without depending upon the Holy Spirit. It's not, it's not going to, you're not going to accomplish what God. Could we stand to have more money? Yes, as a church. But could we stand to have more power of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Because if you got more power, then you're going to accomplish what God calls you to do. And he'll make ways that seems impossible. Possible. He's a way maker. How many have seen God do impossible things in your life? I got hands all over. Yeah. When we connect with God, you know, Sunday I, when I taught at the, at the offering time, I talked about Israel was used to all the miracles that God did. He'd get up and they would have manna and they would have all this supply. But there came a time when they reached the promised land that God said, now you got to be good stewards, not just receivers of miracles, but good stewards. There's a connection and a difference there, right? Doesn't mean you're not going to get a, a, a miracle when you need it. But sometimes the miracle is learning how to use what you have. And God supplies using that seed that God already gave to you. So that's how they describe themselves. How did Jesus describe them? Wretched, poor, Miserable. Naked, miserable. Uh, you don't have it on white garments. They're in a bad shape. The most dangerous place you can be is thinking you're okay when you're not. Especially with the Lord. That's the most dangerous place you can be. So while this church probably didn't want to hear this, what happens when we have transparency? When you have transparency, you're able to see what is really happening and then do something about it. Now, I went to General Ward and he, he would be fine with me telling this. But our, our national bishop, which preached here just a, just a couple of weeks ago, the organization has a lot of debt. We're still dealing with some debt from previous generations and administrations. And so he's just being just totally transparent. And you know what the response of the bishops and the people and the leaders there was? Not I'm mad because we're in debt and we need to work this out, but wow, I appreciate the transparency. Now we know where we're at, and guess what? We're on board with you. We can do something about it. Anybody ever had the Holy Spirit just read your mail? Tell you when you're... <laughs> you thought you were this, but you, you didn't really are over here on the scale, right? We need that. It's hard to welcome that, but we need that as a church. If we as a church, if the Holy Spirit tells me we as a church are on the wrong path, and I'm a leader, then we're going to try to get back on the right path. We're not going to keep heading in the wrong direction and put our head in the sand. I think that's what it means when it says you're blind. Yeah. You don't know where you're going. You can't see. Spiritually blind. Just, I like I like the other one naked too. Meaning you're exposed and vulnerable. Yes, and you are vulnerable when you don't know where you are, and you don't know your true condition. You're really vulnerable as a body or as a person. There's so much depth in this. That's why we can take this one church and teach about it for forty to fifty minutes because there's just so much in here. Bill said he likes that it says they're blind. Well, this area was famous for having a eye salve that they sold to people. And it actually helped heal certain conditions and of the eyes. So that's why the Lord here is saying there's a there's a they understand it. How, how many knows that when, when you teach, if you can use an illustration that somebody understands, they're gonna get it. It's gonna connect. And he's like, hey, you know that eye salve that this area is famous for? You need to get some spiritual eye salve and learn how to see where I'm showing you where you're at, right? And so 
uh, it, it's important. So this, uh, he's saying you're blind, you're spiritually blind. And what part of it is, I think, is that they're seeing only the physical, materialistic things. Their focus was, I'm rich. I'm wealthy. I don't need anything. When all along the poor and miserable and all of this, they, they don't really see because all they see is what's in front of them. Do we have money? Do we have supplies? There's more to life than how much money you have in your bank account or how many investments you have. What kind of great job? Does that mean it's wrong to be rich? Absolutely not. It's also not wrong to be poor. The Bible says we'll have the poor. Always have the poor. We need that money to get rich. Absolutely. If the money gets bigger than God, you're in trouble. It is what you do with it. That's a good point. And there's a difference in having wealth and wealth having you. Are you possessing the wealth and are you making decisions to use it for the Lord and to bless the kingdom? Or are you waking up in the middle of the night thinking, how can I make more? How can I have more? How can I be like the Joneses? And that's just, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to be like the Joneses. Because uh, that's a saying. That, but uh, Are we materialistic in our views or are we really seeing the spirit realm? And it's important for us to, to know that. Not only were they materialistically focused, but wow, wow this is going to sound just like our age, I believe. They were also concerned about the justice of the people. Now that sounds good at first, but what that trans translates is to they were the church of the rights of the people or human rights. So in other words, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to say what I want to say. I'm going to go where I want to go. I'm going to be who I want to be. Let me know that has not ever been a Christian attitude. Because whose are we? We're the Lord's, right? And so it, they, they had this attitude because everything was materialistically focused. I gotta have, I gotta have, I gotta have because I deserve it. How many times do you hear that on TV? You deserve to have this boat. Drink this beer and you'll have all these women that go along with the boat too. I mean, it's just like, you deserve it. You have the right to have it. Well, who owns you? What owns you? Uh, we see this is that human rights focus. Understand me, I'm not saying that we don't have basic human rights. Even our Constitution talked about some of those basic human rights. What I'm saying is everything cannot be about me, me, me. Because we're gods. And Ken, my uncle, and we talk about it every week. You know, the Bible tells us to be a servant. Is the, is the servant saying, this is mine, this is mine? No, I'm stewarding what the master has. So it's not about my rights. It's about blessing the kingdom. That doesn't mean we don't have basic human rights. So don't tell everybody I said you don't have any human rights. Uh, <laughs> we jumped ahead a little bit, but what's the prescription for this church? What's the answer? Well, yes. So, by gold, refined by. So, what the, the value system has to be changed. It has to be not about me, 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 but about the spiritual aspects and being a servant and all of this. And then you really get specific, and we jump ahead. And I just said a little bit ago the prescription for this church is to be zealous and repent. People who were. I focused, focused on themselves, don't like to hear messages about repent. What do you mean? I have the right to be like I am, to do what I want to do. But when the Bible preaches the, teaches the message of salvation, guess where the first place that John the Baptist and Jesus all said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand? Who is he talking to? Not the Gentiles. The people of God, right? Because judgment starts in the house of God, right? The answer for 
us in any state that we are in as Christians is always repentance. And people get weirded out about that. But pastor, I'm saved. Were you perfect today? I wasn't. Do you need to repent sometime? I do. Sometimes I just need to repent because I got a stinking attitude at times. <laughs> I'm in the car, right? <laughs> so, you know, repentance is not just for the sinner. Matter of fact, I would say repentance should start with the Christian and then when people in the world see us living like we ought to because we've got a repentant heart, then they might be more attracted to this lifestyle that we are living. Oh, they need to repent too. So be zealous, be on fire, be excited, be passionate, be determined. Get back on fire for God. The Bible says that we are earthen vessels. We house the Holy Spirit, but we're earthen vessels. Clay, pots. Guess what? They leak. We leak. And that's why when the Bible talks about be filled with the Holy Ghost, that word is not in the past or just in the future. It is a word that is not dependent upon time. So it's saying be filled all the time, every time, every day, every be filled. We need to be zealous. We need to be back on fire for God, passionate, driven. You probably get tired of me being so driven, but I'm a driven person for the Lord. I've seen in the spirit what God wants this church to do, and so therefore, I'm passionate. Have you seen what God wants you to do as a person? Are you passionate about it? Are you pursuing it? Well, I felt the Holy Spirit right there. So you've got to be passionate about God and pursuing. See what God wants you to do in your life and pursue it. Passionate about the Lord. How many of you have seen those pictures of Jesus knocking on the door? Have you seen those? It's a, it's a really neat picture. He's like, it looks like a garden setting in behind him. He's at this door. You may ever notice anything about the door that he's knocking on? No door knocking. Perfect. That's what I was wondering. There's no door knob because I remember my pastor used to say it all the time, the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. Jesus is a gentleman. He will not knock down your door to come and force you to do something. This is a description of the Laodicean church. And where's Jesus in relationship to the church? Outside. Asking. Please let me come in. Well, I felt the Holy Spirit when I said that. I wonder how many times, because we, I want to apply this to us too, because we're not perfect. I'm not saying we're the lady in church, but I wonder how many times we've come to service and the Lord has, has been there. Can I just come in? I want to do something. I want to rock your world. I want to change your family history. I want to do something amazing in your life. Would you just let me come in? Wow, I've got tears in my eyes. Because he's, he's on the outside in relationship to this church. And we have the ability to open the door and let him in. That doesn't mean he's not powerful. He could, but he chooses not to. And so we have the ability to let the Lord on the inside. We have to open the door. And we have to hear his voice. It says he's to hear his voice. How long have you since we've heard the voice of God? You heard it today? Yeah. You, you might be able to answer that question about when's the last time you picked up your Bible because you can hear the voice of God through that, right? I'm not saying you have to hear an audible voice. Many times God gives us premonitions. God gives us thoughts. And God gives us people who say, I feel like God wants me to tell you this. And, and then many times God can speak to us. Yeah, God can send a prophet. God can confirm through other people. So are we listening for the voice of God? Or are we consumed about what's going on inside the house? Our house. It's important. Do we hear the voice of God? Or are we so concerned with our own rights that we put Jesus out 
of the house. As he's knocking, does Jesus feel like he's an outsider in, in our lives, in the church? Oh, I hope not. I think we can make him welcome. Many times when we lead worship and I come up to preach, I, I'm led to say, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We roll out the red carpet. I don't mean a literal red carpet. I mean, we want what you want. Come on in. Wreck us if you have to. I've said that a couple times. Like sometimes God will change your thinking and your motivation and just mess you up. He does that. Have you ever had God just do that for you? I remember Charles McKinley many times, and this is this was in relation to this, saying, ever so often, I just throw everything that I believe about the Lord and my relationship with God, and I throw it up in the air, and I let it fall right down and let the Lord sort it out. And sometimes God will change and mess me up. He say, you say things like that. And I always thought, that's weird. But now I know what he's talking about. Are we open to the Holy Spirit messing us up, changing us, shifting our thought patterns? What's the reward for those who overcome? What does it say? What is the reward? Sit with him on the throne. Wow. We will rule and reign with Christ. Not because we're deserving, but because he won it all. And we're his sons and we're the God's sons and daughters, and we're brothers and sisters of Christ. I don't know if you ever think about that or not, but wonder what our jobs will be whenever the millennial the reign is and we're and we you know that's way in the future in Revelation, but if we're ruling and reigning, what are we over? What are we doing? I've already told the Lord I want to be in charge of tourism. Because <laughs> I love to travel. And I want to go to the Bahamas and all kinds of, all over the world. And just see the beauty. You know what I'm saying? He's going to create a new world, by the way. And it's going to be even more beautiful than it is right now because sin has corrupted this world. And so I want to be on the tourism team. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do. But the Bible says we'll rule and reign with Christ. Because, why? Because Jesus is, has all authority and he's given that. Just like he did his disciples when he was here on earth. He said, I send you in, in, in all my authority. Go cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the, raise the do all of that. Because he's given us the authority. We don't deserve this. We haven't earned this but we will rule and reign with Christ. So how, question number one, how is Jesus described in verse 14? Amen. Amen. Faithful and true witness. Faithful and true witness. Beginning of creation of God. Beginning of the creation of God. Question two, surely to goodness, even if you didn't listen much at all, you can get the answer to this. The church of Laodicea was neither or hot, or hot or cold, right? What will Jesus do with a with this lukewarm church? Spew it out, mama to doubt. What did the church of Laodicea, question number four, say about itself? Rich, wealthy, don't need anything. Rich, wealthy, don't need anything. What did Jesus say about them? Just the opposite. The opposite. You're wretched. Miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You're in bad shape, right? That's what he said. What was the prescription for Laodicea? We kind of mentioned a couple of different things. Be zealous, be zealous and repent. We also said that you have to change, change your, value system. your value system, yes. To the to the gold of the the refined body. Yes, that. My thought was it says earnest instead of zealous, which I think played up to that faithful and true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, in relation to this church, question number seven, where is Jesus and what is he doing? Outside and asking. Outside and knocking on the door, whatever, however you state it.